How has that journey been going from zero followers to now, I believe, over 300,000 followers on Twitter? Yeah, it's been absolutely mind blowing. Some concepts that I always talk about consistency, compounding, goes slow until it goes fast. Somewhere in there, at first, my growth slowed down. We went from adding maybe four or 5,000 followers a month to an average of 20,000 new followers every month for the last year. And so somewhere in that journey, a lot of people give up, they quit. Instead of saying, I'm going to keep doing this until the compounding does its magic. And as long as you look at it, what I like to think about as a creator, as a writer, as a podcaster, is look at the data. One, focus on the process over the results. And from a results perspective, just look at the trends. Are my downloads increasing week over week, month over month, year over year? Am I getting more engagement on my social? Are my followers growing? And if it's consistent up and to the right, at some point it will go exponential. Yeah, I love what you said there. It's not always about the results. It's the process that's extremely important. If you just become obsessed with the process to get to those results and not so much the results, you will see exponential success versus the people who see want these big results, don't get them and then just quit. If you have the obsession with the process, you won't give up. You will continue to refine this process and then you will start to see success. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we have a really special guest, Clint Murphy. Clint Murphy is the CEO and founder of The Growth Guide, the author of The Growth Guide newsletter, and the host of The Growth Guide podcast. Clint, how are you? Thanks for coming on. I'm doing really well today. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. I'm very excited as well. I always forget to do this, but I'm going to remember today. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, anything to help us continue to grow and make sure that we can get Clint's story out to as many people as possible. Clint, I, you know, we just met right before this, but let's just get a little intro, talk about yourself and start from there. You bet. So the intro I'd always start with first and foremost, I'm a father to two young boys. They turn in a little over a month, they'll turn 15 and 12 years old. Awesome. I've been with my wife for 27 years now. So for a lot of our listeners, that's most of their lives or more. <laughs> uh, by day, I'm a CFO at a real estate development company. I've been in finance for 23 years. And in the evenings, I'm a creator. So I write a newsletter that now goes out to 9,200 people every week. We release a podcast episode once a week as well. And we are on social media, mainly Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram, we have 305,000 followers on Twitter as the biggest awesome. one and then about 55 between LinkedIn and Instagram. And that all ties together into what I call our growth guide flywheel, which I'm sure we're going to get into today. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. And maybe a great place to start is how do you have the time as a CFO during the day to do all this amazing stuff after? The interesting part, and I've had this conversation with a few people, and you hear it a lot when you are on Money Twitter, is people talk about the fact that when you say yes to something, what are you saying no to? And for me, the yes is everything we we just talked about. I read a book a week. I write every day. I post on social every day. And I know that the newsletter has to come out and the podcast has to come out. So those aren't negotiable. So they're all yeses. So then the other things become the no's. Going to events, going out for drinks, hanging out with friends. A lot of that becomes a quick no. Unless it's scheduled, it's intentional and there's a purpose to it. There's a lot less. Pre-COVID, there'd be a lot of, let's call it family gatherings yep. on a Saturday or Sunday, let's go just hang out for four hours or five hours with grandma and grandpa and just chill. And those are the things that while COVID was here, they weren't optional. And so post COVID, I've continued to operate as if they're not optional. And that has freed up so much time to focus on the things that matter to me. Awesome. That's amazing. And I think that is extremely important what you said there, just being extremely intentional 
about the things that add value to you and what you want to accomplish is extremely important. And something that I struggle with too, as a young entrepreneur, it's hard sometimes to really be disciplined and do the things that you need to do when there's those looming temptations of let's go out with some friends, let's go get some drinks, let's go do something with my girlfriend and her family. But I like the way that you frame that is that if you say yes, those are non negotiables, you will find a way to make it work. And maybe you do have to start saying no to some of those things. But as long as you prioritize those things and make them non negotiables, it makes things a little easier to just make some quick decisions and say, hey, that's a no, because I have the podcast tonight, or that's a no, because I need to write my newsletter. So I love that take. And the other take that's relevant for some of the young listeners who may want to do what you're doing, or who may want to do what I'm doing, and what other creators are doing is for a period of time, there's a fair amount of sacrifice. Yep. And early on, on your creator journey, you often don't have your partner bought in, you don't have your family and friends bought in. And so during that time, your sacrifice can often be sleep. So it's when do you find the time? Will I sleep less? I'm creating at night, I'm writing, I'm reading, I'm engaging with people on social media, and, and I'm staying up late and I'm waking up early. Probably about a year and a bit into the journey, my wife started to be a believer. And so about six months ago, she retired from her job and is now part of the Growth Guide team. And so oh, that's Instagram, amazing. The LinkedIn and, and a fair amount more she's responsible for. The studio light background, using a bit of a better camera. She's building out a YouTube program for us. So now it's not just me doing it. So you'll hear me a lot in the conversation use we, and that's because I look at it as a partnership between my wife and I to build out the growth guide and to eventually have that ability to pivot from being a full-time employee while being a creator in the evenings to being a full-time creator is what I do all day, every day. And I think we're getting close, which really excites me. That is amazing and extremely exciting. And and I would say that's a goal of mine as well. Obviously, I'm young. I'm trying to accomplish certain things and a nice steady income at a good company is really helpful. But I don't let that take away from once that laptop closes, being able to jump into my other things that I think will be with me for a long time down the road. And my end goal is to have something or create something that allows me to have that freedom to be able to do things like this that I actually really enjoy and I'm really excited about. And that's getting to meet really cool people like yourself. And I'm hoping that this is going to kind of be that driving force for me. It was my big leap. I typically built my companies quietly, no promotion, no social media, no presence. And now I've started to realize that you could tap into so much when people start to really get to know you and relate to you, especially when you build a brand. And I was able to find you through your amazing brand on Twitter and all the amazing things that you share. And the more I dug in, I found more and more amazing amazing things like that newsletter, like the podcast. How has building your personal brand been an asset to you during this journey? It's been exponential. And so let's talk about the flywheel and how it all works. So this all started because like you, I launched a podcast. At the time, it was the pursuit of learning. And that's that after about a year and a half, it came the growth guide. And I'll, I'll explain that transition. And when you start a podcast, it's very hard to grow because you're putting out your episodes into the other. And unless they really resonate, with someone, they don't have that ability to go viral. Or unless you're already a bit of a celebrity off platform, off podcast to launch the podcast, you don't have that inertia. So how do you get it? And what I looked at is, and when we talk flywheel, this is a concept by Jim Collins for businesses. And it's the idea of those gears that they're really big and heavy and you're pushing to get them moving. But once they're going, they get the momentum and they're spinning and the velocity keeps going faster and faster and growing the business. And so the way I look looked at it was if I could grow on social, I could reach out to bigger guests. If I could book bigger guests, I could write about it on social and they would just keep beating each other up the ladder. So it was, I want to get to 20,000 followers on Twitter, and that'll allow me to get to this many downloads a month on the podcast. And then I can get to 50, and then I can get to this. In, in a simple example of that flywheel, when I'm just starting out on the podcast, and I reach out to you and you're a best-selling author, and I say, hey, would you like to come out and be on my podcast? It'll go out to my mom, my dad, and my four or five friends. And what's your answer going to be as a best-selling author? Probably no, unless I'm a really nice person. 
Yeah, exactly. And so I told you numbers were not at yet, but the target numbers where I think, yes, this is becoming very substantial and real. If we have 1 million followers on social, 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, 100,000 newsletter subscribers, and 100,000 downloads a month on a podcast. Now I reach out to you as a best-selling author. What's your likely response? It's a no-brainer. I get to put myself in front of hundreds of thousands of people and promote what I'm putting out into the world. And so I think at that scale, there's very few people who are releasing a book who we shouldn't be able to get. And my goal is that you walk into an indigo and you look in the self-development, self-help, space or personal finance. And there's a brand new book coming out that is New York Times bestseller. And any of them are on the show. That's the goal. Those are the conversations I want to be having. So I need to get to those numbers to book those conversations. So the the social media has been a massive driver of getting to that stage. That's awesome. And a little bit different, but almost the same concept is the reason why I started the podcast. I saw the value of short form content, putting yourself out there, letting people hear your perspective, your point of view on things. But I just really didn't have the time to sit there and make this content. But I thought if I can make a podcast, I can clip parts of all of these episodes and have these moments where I'm talking about the things that I would have liked to talk in the short form content. And now I'm kind of getting the best of both worlds. But you've put an even better kind of level on that where you're going down into the followers and just the continued growth. And I think that's the amazing part of social media. And it's funny, I have a podcast with two of my best friends called Three's a Crowd. And we were talking, we had an episode and the episode was our major consumer big box brands dead in 20 years. And I said, maybe a little tin haddish, but I think it's possible with the continued explosion of creators like Mr. Beast, like the Kardashians, like people like to poke jokes and say that they're a YouTuber and things like that. They have the perfect audience at their disposal at the click of a button at any moment. And that is a amazing like the ability to watch and even prime is a great example with logan paul i'm looking around here in miami and there's prime in my Publixes, there's prime in my supermarkets in the vitamin shops like these creators are really building billion dollar businesses on the back of their social media following so i think it's ever more crucial to at least have some type of social presence i don't think any young person so remember dad of a a soon-to-be 15 and 12 year old a lot of parents that have 15 and 12 year olds will bemoan socials and not want their children anywhere near it. I've already said to my boys, when it comes to summer jobs, you have two options. Sure, you can go work at McDonald's and and flip some burgers, and and I did that growing up. And hey, by the way, you won't be able to play on your basketball team because it's going to compete with the weekends, and and you might have to miss some training. And hey, when when we go on a family vacation, you'll stay at home and pick up your shifts. Or you can come work for mom and me in our growth guide business. And you can pick a platform that you want to become an expert in and we'll pay for you to take courses. We'll buy you the equipment. You'll be put in charge of that platform. You'll be given responsibilities and assignments and we'll teach you how to be a YouTuber. We'll we'll help you learn how to do Instagram, how to grow on Twitter. So instead of looking at social media as, as an evil that I want my kids to avoid, I want them to learn the ins and outs of social media because anyone today as a young person like yourself, you should all be building a personal brand because it can be your virtual resume. If you want to be someone who works for a high-end AI company or a, an interior design company, if you're writing about it on social media, if you're sharing your design ideas on Instagram, the people that you want to eventually work for or work with are going to see you if you're doing that right. And that's going to give you a path that a person who just goes to school and just does their intern and then hands in a resume, but they don't have that following, they don't have that inertia, you're going to get the opportunity first. I totally agree. And I think that's amazing. That's I hope there's parents listening that take some advice from that, because I also think not only showing that, showing them that sets them up for success, but social media can be extremely addicting. It can be something that you use incorrectly. But I think if you learn at a young age what it really is at the core, how businesses operate on it, you get a little bit of a better understanding and you get less caught up in a lot of the buzz and the nonstop scrolling. So I think it'll actually be beneficial to them when they get on social media as they get older. They know when, hey, I've been sitting here for two and a half hours, maybe I should get off or they'll know why not to be 
stuck in that position. So I think that's really cool. And I actually was listening to a podcast, I forget the name, but I, a professor at a college teaching a master's and MBA, she was one of the professors. And she actually for her class, the first day of school, people showed up and she said, pick a social media, it can either be Twitter, TikTok or Instagram, you have the rest of the semester to go viral, you'll be graded on the performance of your platform. And I was like, man, like, that's a pretty cool idea. Because I mean, it's it's relevant at this point, when you start to look at the amount of money some people make on these platforms. I mean, these are legitimate businesses at this point, this is not just a game or something fun. So professors like that kind of leaning in, I think are super cool. Yeah, I read an article on this one last month, and the prof was an actual marketing executive. And he was so he was coming to this school and teaching this class. And he said, you know, we want to see if you can take the techniques and go viral. And if so, if someone gets to a million views on a video, then we won't have a final exam. And one of the young women in the class while he was doing it, she took out her phone and she filmed what he was saying. Mm. And so immediately she went to TikTok, did some cuts and said, help me not have to take my final exam. Let's get to a million. And she did it within a week. That is amazing. She just had that, like, think of everyone who was in that room. All the students are listening. They're like, what the heck is happening? She has the presence of mind to pull out her phone, film them talking about it. She zoomed over to the chalkboard, you know, no final exam. If we hit this number, probably wasn't a chalkboard nowadays, but that might say my age. And (laughs) then she puts some, you know, good music to it, gets the clip going and doesn't have to take a final exam. Absolutely amazing example of of someone as a professor saying, hey, let's take it out of theory and let's bring this to real life. But also as a a genius young woman to be able to take that real time and within a week act on it. That was phenomenal to me. Yeah, no, that that is super cool. And I didn't know that that was another kind of iteration of probably the story that I heard. And that's that's amazing and, and really cool that she was able to accomplish that. And just smart on her part, just flat out smart. The free content was right in front of her. Let's talk about your content. I know you have a lot of following on socials, but Twitter is where I found you and Twitter is where you seem to excel with your biggest following. How has that journey been going from zero followers to now, I believe over 300,000 followers on Twitter? Yeah, it's been absolutely mind blowing. And (laughs) the the important thing is, is it it goes some concepts that I always talk about consistency, compounding goes slow until it goes fast. So if you look at it, I got serious about about Twitter in August of 2021. And when we crossed January, December 2021 into January, we were at 10,000. By April, we were at 20. So things were moving decently. And I started to write threads. I wrote threads, which are a series of tweets telling a story or sharing information. I I wrote 75 days in a row, roughly, threads. And somewhere in there, at first, my growth slowed down. And then once the threads started to catch on, we went from adding maybe four or 5,000 followers a month to an average of 20,000 new followers every month for the last year. That's amazing. So over the last year, we've added 285,000 followers. Wow. So you look at that, the first year or a year and a bit, we add 20,000 followers. The next year we add 285. And so, you know, it was going slow and somewhere in that journey, a lot of people give up. They quit. Instead of saying, I'm going to keep doing this until the compounding does its magic. And as long as you look at it, what I like to think about as a creator, as a writer, as a podcaster, is look at the data. One, focus on the process over the results. So always yep. focus on the process. And from a results perspective, just look at the trends. Are my downloads increasing week over week, month over month, year over year? Am I getting more engagement on my social? Are my followers growing? And what am, what is that path and what is that progression? And if it's consistent up and to the right, at some point it will go exponential. Yeah, I love what you said there. It's not always about the results. It's the process that's extremely important. I had my best friend on the last episode, Nick Fusco, the founder of El Mago Cigars, and he just built this cigar company in his early 20s from the ground up. And I asked him, I said, hey, we've done a lot of business together. I get to talk to you all the time. What's some advice you could give some younger people starting their businesses for the first time? And he's like, a ton of people get so locked in to what the results need to be. I need to have these certain accomplishments. I need to look this 
certain way. But if you just become obsessed with the process to get to those results and not so much the results, you will see exponential success versus the people who see want these big results, don't get them and then just quit. If you have the obsession with the process, you won't give up. You will continue to refine this process and then you will start to see success. So I, I love that point. And a big part of that and based on my chat with you before we started this episode and even what you're saying in the episode, a big part of that is surrounding yourself with the right people. So uh, the story I heard about Mr. Beast was he had a group of friends that were all on YouTube and they were obsessed. They talked about YouTube all day, every day. And after a year, they were all at a million followers. Yep. So who is that in your group that pushes three things to me? People that push you, challenge you, and support you. If you have friends who are like that, and I'll give you an example. Curtis Henney, who I teach a Twitter growth guide community where we help people grow on Twitter. So Curtis and I found each other when we were at about a thousand followers each. And he's at about 160 now. I'm I'm at 305. So we've grown a lot together. And we've talked Twitter almost every day for one and a half years. That's amazing. And yeah. And and but part of it is, you know, he was bemoaning a little bit recently the algo. And I said to my friend, sorry, Curtis, I'm calling you out on this one. I, I said, hey, Curtis, like, it's what we tell our students. It's not the algo, it's you. So what are you doing that isn't good enough? You're phoning it in. You're not putting enough into your writing. You're not putting enough into your hooks. And really challenged him. And within a couple days, he went viral again. That's awesome. He thought of a hook. He sent it to me and another buddy, Steve Adcock, who who's one of the other founders and, and teachers in our cohort community. And he said, what do you guys think of this hook? We beat it up a little and helped him make it the best it could be. And he went viral a day later. And so there's two ways I could have done that. I could have been nice to my friend and let it go and let him keep putting content out that wasn't as good as it otherwise should be. Or I could be a true friend, a friend who says, I'm going to push, challenge, and support you. And right now you need a push. You don't need me to support you and say, yeah, you're right. It's the algo. You need me to challenge you and push you to be the best you can and say, hey, the writing's not good enough, needs to be better. Here's some ideas you need to think about. And the best part about someone who, when you have that friendship, is they know that that's what you're doing and they rise to the challenge. Because the only other time where it was like that for him, he came to me with a thread and it was all right, but it did pretty bad. And he said, hey, why didn't this do well? And I said, it's too dense too many words, people aren't going to want to read it. Like you need it to be shorter, tighter and simpler. Like it just wasn't good. And I wasn't saying it to be mean. I was saying like, you've asked me why it didn't work. Like that's legitimately why it didn't work. The next day he released a book thread that is now like the template that almost anyone who writes a book thread on Twitter uses. That's they amazing. Use books, they use it for quotes, they use it for movies. And he created that the next day. That's so amazing. like he's a guy who rises to the challenge. And so to be the friend, to have that circle, like you're starting to build, it sounds like, and then to be able to push each other and support each other and challenge each other, where you'll go in this world is exponentially awesome. I think you're so spot on with that. And it's cool. I actually, Curtis is coming on the show on Tuesday. So oh, I'm really, okay. yeah, Curtis is coming on Tuesday, working on Steve as well. We were messaging back and forward yesterday. So really cool. And this is one of my favorite quotes. And I think it fits perfectly here. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And that's why I myself am extremely intentional. And some people may think I'm crazy. I don't love going out a ton. I don't love spending time with a bunch of new people. That's not to say that I don't like to network and meet new people. But when I spend intimate, quality, small group time, I love to be with a certain group of people. Everybody in that group brings different values. It's constantly, like you said, pushing each other to get better. And I think that's super valuable and why a lot of people around me all around my age have started companies, been really successful. And I think it's because we've all pushed each other really hard to just be a little bit different, to kind of prioritize these certain things that maybe aren't the cool things to be doing at our age. So I love that that from you. I would love to talk a little bit about the growth guide, everything you're building with that, how that journey's been. 
So if we take a step back, the so I started in August, April 2021 with the podcast, and, and the goal was, and I, I was clear with work that I would work a certain length of time and that I would retire early. And I always knew at that point what I wanted to do. I created this vision at the start of 2020, right before COVID actually. And so I went on a silent retreat, January 2020, and I got back and I created a roadmap for myself. And it said the purpose or the mission in life was to help as many people as possible grow personally, professionally, and financially, and to do it with absolute freedom, where I want, when I want, how I want, what I want, if I even want, right? So full freedom, full yep. life freedom. And the idea was that I would write, podcast, public speak, coach and consult, private equity, and real estate investing. Those were the five avenues. Two awesome. of them have two, but we'll ignore that. So five avenues. And for each of those avenues, I created a roadmap. What do I want? For example, one of the ones was be a top coach in Canada. Another one was, you know, a top 10 podcast. When I looked down at what it took to do them, it was, what do I want? What are the things I need to achieve in order to do that? What are the education requirements I need to get to in order to do that? One of the things for all of them was build a brand. And so I said, I started to notice that. And then COVID hit and fast forward about 10 months lockdown, kids activities canceled. We had a lot of kids activities. So that was chewing up a lot of time. I was coaching some things, family not allowed to visit here where I live, where you live, that that would have been short lived and everyone would have been allowed, <laughs> allowed to go about their, their lives again shortly thereafter. But here you are on lockdown. Yeah. And so what that looked like is as a person who likes to have a lot on the go, all of a sudden there was just an insane amount of time. Why am I going to wait until I get to retirement before I start all these things? Why don't I just start building the brand now and have some fun? Got time. So I launched the podcast and then I got onto Twitter. And, and the idea is helping people grow personally, professionally, and financially is still the goal. But the way I phrase it now with the growth guide is I want to help people live better, achieve more, and be financially free. So I can do that through having the right guests on the podcast, writing articles about those three things in the newsletter, and writing about them on Twitter and sharing them on other forms of social media, including YouTube, where we're going to go. And, and what does that look like? It, it means at some point, once it's financially viable, I pivot away from working full time to focusing on those things. And that's the five things. So already I'm writing. Eventually it will be books. Some of the newsletter articles will form parts of those books. When it comes to podcasts, that's already there. Eventually that'll be a revenue stream. The newsletter wasn't in the list of five. Maybe we'll put that in writing. <laughs> And then you have public speaking. When I'm not working full time and I've built up enough of a brand, there's an opportunity to go do public speaking engagements. So those are some of the active uh, money routes. Coaching and consulting will fall out of that. And those are what I look at. Interesting, Danny V on Twitter shared a diagram the other day. And I realized we had the exact same goal. And he, he had a triangle. And he had content, active income, passive income. And so when you look at my triangle, it's all built around social. Social encompasses, that's the content. Then you have the active income, which is the writing, the podcasting, the public speaking, the coaching and consulting. On the passive side, Side, although not 100% passive, but that will be the real estate investing and the private equity investing. The goal with the private equity investing is similar to Cody Sanchez. I want to be able to buy the businesses and be an active shareholder, not an active manager. And so buy businesses, install a leadership team and be an active shareholder, board meetings, etc., but not be in the day to day. And so that's what the growth guide looks like. That's the five year, 10 year, 20 year vision is I'll pivot to that. And that's something I will do for the rest of my life, you know, till the day I die, because those are things that I'm passionate about. So I won't look at them as I'm going to work. I'll wake up and be like, all right, I get to write, I get yep. to engage, I get to coach, I get to run a business. These are my passions. How do I fit life around those? So that's where the growth guide's going. That's the vision. That's amazing. And I can really see eye to eye with you on that because that's a goal of mine. Obviously I'm young and I just started my career, but everything that I'm doing now is ultimately to allow myself to be free as quick and as early as possible because I I want to be able to wake up and do these things that I really love. Like Curtis, for example, him and I have an episode on Tuesday early in the morning. I'm not a huge morning person, but it's not hard for me to get up and be excited to film another episode of this podcast because it's something I genuinely enjoy. And that's the number one goal of mine right now. And I talk to my partner a lot about this and, and she's understood a lot of the decisions we make now might not be the cool and fun thing to do when you're in your early 20s. But 
they're going to make the latter part of our life a lot better because we're getting so ahead and we're doing the right things financially now, which is hard because when you're younger, everybody around you isn't on that same program, isn't on that same page. And it's sometimes it's tough to really stay in your lane and keep your head down, continue to grow. So I love hearing your reasons behind this because what you're doing now is what I want to be doing in the future. So it's really cool to get to talk with you and hear about how you're making it a reality right now. You're working towards being able to leave the day-to-day job and do this creator thing full time, which is something that I really want to do because this is what I'm passionate about. I love talking to people. I love mentorship. I built a few companies early on in college. It's kind of centered around sneakers and what I was passionate about at the time. But out of all of those, I had a mentorship company where I would teach you how to leverage these tools and make side income. And that was by far my most rewarding business that I started. It wasn't the most profitable, but for some reason, I just always found that one being the one that I enjoyed the most. And then when I looked back and matured a little bit and got a little older, I think it was because I really had a passion for helping people and watching them succeed. So I think it's really cool that that's really what your growth business is centered around. And and your goal is to just continue to deliver amazing content to individuals so that we can all keep growing. And somewhere where I'm going to challenge you on, brother. So you've said a couple of times in the conversation that that you're doing X, Y, and Z, and that's not the cool thing to do. And where I want to challenge you is to think about, because you're delaying gratification. And from a perception standpoint, that may not be the cool thing to do. The people that are at the club, the people that are partying, the people that aren't saving, the people that aren't putting the hours in at home, filming their podcast, maybe perceptionally, that's the cool thing to do. And when you're in your 30s, and then when you're in your 40s, and they're listening to your podcast and saying, I wish I'd done that when I was 20. This dude's so cool. Like you're doing the right thing. You're investing in your future. And the best part is you're having fun, I assume. You're doing this because you love it. And so that's cool. Like cool isn't what other people look at. And so Derek Sivers said this to Tim Ferriss the other day when people ask him how he defines success, it's always been internal. And someone said, well, you don't care about how other people think about you? He said, well, no. Like, why would I care? Like, so no one, you are doing the things that are cool. You are doing the things that are going to set you up for an amazing future and an amazing life. And that element of delayed gratification is where so many people fail on their journey. They're not willing to give up today for a future version of, the, of themselves because they're so focused on the loss of today and the not being cool, if you will, today versus, holy shit, what am I going to be tomorrow? And the, that is one of the number one thing we want to get across to young people. Like I say to my two sons, life is simple. And I write about this on Twitter, but I've been telling them this since they were eight or nine years old. Know what you want, understand what it takes, do the work day in and day And I'll use my oldest son as an example. Potentially, you might say when you looked at him at 9, 10, 11, not the most athletic gifted kid relative to some of the other kids that you you would see. And you may still say that, but if you look at him relative to his peers from where he was then to where he is now, it's exponentially different. In every sport, he's moved up the ladder. And how does he do that? That kid outworks almost anyone I know. Like 10, 15 hours of deep, deliberate practice a week. He'll do 10 to 12 hours at school for football or basketball. And then he'll do another six hours of basketball with his academy team. And then he has three hours with a personal trainer. And so what I'm seeing happen with his body is insane. And he knows, I keep reinforcing with him, you you might not be getting minutes on the basketball team today. You're on the team. You get minutes during the regular season. You're on the bench in the playoffs. That's okay. We're not playing for today. We're playing for varsity. Yep. You're not playing to be the best in grade nine. You're playing to be a shit kicker in grade 12 because grade grade 11 and 12 are going to determine whether you get a college scholarship for basketball or football. And so we have three years to put in the hours and outwork everyone else so that when you get to grade 11 and 12, you're a physical beast. And I'm seeing it happen in front of my eyes and he's seeing it. And so he's always listened and he's always just focused on the process. But dude's starting to see results. (laughs) You know, like at the gym this morning with his trainer, they were doing, uh, his trainer was getting him to do uh, sled pushes. 
And his trainer put this on his own Instagram. It was like a 450 pound sled. The trainer was like, I can't do this. Showed himself trying it. And then he's like, my 14 year old student can. And That's he amazing. Showed, he showed our son like pushing the sled. And I'm like, if you're pushing a 450 pound sled across the gym at 14, like what you're going to be doing when you're 18 and you're in grade 12, it's going to be friggin' sk- like, I don't want to be the quarterback when you're rushing me. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's those deliberate reps. It's the <clears throat> delaying the gratification. And it's focusing far enough into the future and breaking it back to today. That's what's going to set you up for success. So to me, as an outsider, you are the cool one. Thank you. That, that, that's, a, that's awesome. And, and I, I appreciate that. And I love the perspective of your son. I was an athlete my whole life, played college sports, played high school sports. And all of the messaging that you're sending from the top down right now is amazing. And what my dad did for me. So your son is extremely lucky because that's, that's a great, that's where it really starts coming from you. And I love just the thought process right there. Like this is a minor part of this whole episode, but just the thought process on like, enjoy the fact that you are where you are in ninth grade. But what we're working towards is 11 and 12, because that's where the results really matter. And again, going back to we're not obsessed with the results, we're being very obsessed with the process to get those results. And you will start to see it start it pay off. So uh, that's really amazing. And I think such a great way for you to put that. Yeah. And what's important is because you played in high school, you played in college, and for his high school, they dominate in sports. And the interesting part is, so we, we have provinces versus state, but let's use state. So it, it's easier for you. They've now grade eight and nine. So two years, they've been the state champions for football and basketball. So, so wow. four state championships in his first two years. Where they start to have trouble is grade 11 and 12 varsity. And, and you and I know it's great to win in grade eight yeah. and nine, but when do you want to win? You want to win when you're in varsity. So their varsity team did win football this year, but they've been blanked for a long time. Wow. And they haven't won. I don't even know if they've won basketball. And so they have a great team, but how do you be the best team three years from now? Because you seem to be able to win in grade eight, nine, and 10, but not at varsity. How do we break that? And we break it by every kid on the team focusing three years out and doing what they need to be to be the best version of them when they can get there. And that's what no one realizes is 80% likelihood that the kids that are making that team aren't the ones that are on the team that's winning today. Yep. They're going to grow differently. They're, they're going to drop out. They're going to get other interests. Everything's going to change. And so how do you make sure that you've got enough of them focusing in the right direction to get there three years from now? That's amazing. And and this episode has really been filled with so many amazing nuggets. And if you're still with us here now, I hope you're taking notes and writing some of these things down because these are just key pillars to being a successful individual, whether it's related to high school sports, your early 20s, 30s, 40s, like all of this stuff is extremely applicable. Something I love to do at the end of every episode is take back kind of everything that we've done and ask a super simple question. The answer can be as complex as you want it or as simple as you want it. But I love to ask my guests, what are you excited about in the near future? The excitement for me is going to see all of these things come together. And so you and I were talking off air. I believe that where it's going to happen is when we do start on YouTube. And I think that for a few reasons. I've been talking with a lot of other creators and on some of the podcasts I've been on. And one of the biggest challenges that I see right now is a lack of of genuineness, a lack of substance behind the platform. And so what I mean by that is so many of the people we see on Twitter, on Instagram, even LinkedIn, where it's primarily written, they're hiring ghostwriters. They're not writing the content. They may not be living the content. And where that starts to get dispelled, where it starts to be shown is when someone like you brings them onto the podcast and you ask them questions that they would be writing about on Twitter. And you start to see that the substance is not behind the person. And so I think that people will start to demand that the creators who are out there show the person behind the curtain, be on Instagram, be on Twitter, be on YouTube, be in social audio media rooms. Because I think you're getting a flavor and your listeners will that the way I respond off the cuff 
to the questions you ask, and you could throw anything at me, they can in a social audio media room. And I'll give very similar responses to everything that I write on the platform. And so it gives you visibility into the fact that I write my content. Yeah. I speak my truth. I speak from a place of lived experience. Everything that I write about for you or for the listeners or for the readers on Twitter or my podcast, it almost all comes from having lived it in real life. Me, my family, my children. And so that differentiates you from someone who's paying someone to create all their content. And so I think we need to see more of this, more people coming on these shows, having these conversations. And I'm personally excited to see people start to demand that and to be in a spot where I can demonstrate being one of the people that is living what they're writing. I absolutely love that answer. And I've followed you. I've seen your content as I've tried to scale my Twitter, my personal Twitter, which got me to this point. And getting to meet you now prior to the episode and then spending these last 45 minutes chatting, I think you're extremely genuine and should be at the forefront of creators who show that that's really them behind the curtain because you've done such an amazing job and i think anybody that listens to you or gets the chance to meet you will be able to say the same if they haven't already so clint i want to thank you so much for coming on the show it was absolutely amazing to have you as a guest and i know that our relationship will not end here so thank you so much thanks brother it was a blast talking to you